probably working on that. Okay, cool. Thanks. Father, dear Jesus, Holy Spirit, we present ourselves before you again this Sunday. We gather to embrace your wholeness because we are immersed in a world of brokenness. Disintegrated by our rejection of your design, we wander forlorn amidst the ruins of Eden. Sapped by pain and grief, we long for justice and joy. A bit of justice long sought highlights the limits of fairness and fallenness. We will not see ultimate wholeness in this world you made and we pillaged. We are wicked all. Our particular sins may be less egregious, but wickedness permeates every heart. Our hope of justice and joy is in you. At great cost, you offer forgiveness because we know not what we do. We do not understand the pain we cause. Some of us wouldn't perpetrate if we knew, but some of us take pleasure in the pain. You, Lord, do not enjoy pain. You weep, you mourn, you keep records. Vengeance is yours, not ours, and you will repay. How we long for the life you designed we long for the new creation where joy is serious business, where fairness and peace reign, where Eden is regenerated. We will never give up seeking your wholeness. There is always more. 
in our own hearts and in the world. And the best, the fullness of joy is yet to be. Amen. Amen. Well, we have a special treat today. Um, former uh, worshiper with us, uh, been with us many times actually, uh, Mike McQueen is here today to uh, give us a message about evangelism. And I know that's been what we've been talking about, so uh, I think this is very timely and uh, just thought we should welcome Mike back and glad to have him here. So Mike, would you wanna come up now? And uh, the kids can be dismissed by the way. Do you mind if I pray for you real quick? Okay. God, just thank you for Mike and for just all the work he's done for many, many years, uh, evangelizing, uh, working with many international students at the university and just all the fruits that his uh, ministry has, has uh, been bearing for, for a long, long time. And uh, I just want to pray, uh, for the ministry and i also just want to thank you for his gifts in that area and i just pray that you would uh bless him today with uh, the words that, that we all need to hear and uh, just thank you uh for bringing him here again with us today and pray that in your name jesus amen, amen. Thank you. 
I'm told I can take this off while I preach. Good. Not that you want to look at my ugly mug necessarily, but uh, it's so hard to speak when you've got a mask on. And I promise not to spit, Karen, so I won't be hitting you and Jerry. I don't know whether I need this or not, but I'll get out just in case. Well, it's good to be with you today. Uh, I know a lot of you, maybe most of you. If I could see behind the masks, I'd probably know more of you. First thing I want to do is I want to thank you so much for your support for our ministry. Um, my wife said if I forgot to say that, I would be in big trouble. So thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Um, for those of you who don't know us, uh, Gwen and I have been doing international uh, student ministry here for the last 34 years. Um, we uh, got our start before that. Uh, my first pastor was in New York City. We, we met a bunch of Chinese people at that time and uh, began to, hey, this is kind of fun to work with these, these people. And then we went to Los Angeles where uh, we did ministry at the, uh, UCLA, which we learned after we got there does not stand for the University of California at Los Angeles. It stands for the University of Caucasians Lost Among Asians. Uh, there were a lot of Asians at UCLA, and uh, we began to get more and more involved. So when we came back here in 1987, um, we knew we wanted to work with internationals. We weren't exactly sure what that would look like when we came, but I began to get more and more immersed in the Chinese uh, community. And, and so today, I not only serve with Chinese students at the university, but I work with Chinese churches in Peoria, Springfield, and here. And Gwen got involved with a group that was just getting started up called International Women's Connection, uh, which is an outreach to the wives of international students. And uh, they've had a phenomenal ministry over the years. Uh, ironically, we weren't sure what would happen once COVID began that, uh, you know, we might not possibly have as many opportunities. And that's, that's kind of been true with me, but with International Women's Connection, they've actually had more women coming. They've got women right now who actually join them from China and from Brazil online because they, they do everything they do online. So it's, it's, uh, it's been kind of cool to see what the Lord has done through International Women's Connection. So, and, and you have been a part of that through your, your prayers and through your giving, and, and we are very thankful for that. So anyway, so how long do I have? Uh, an hour. <laughs> I'm also a part-time professor. I love to lecture, but I, I, I won't do that. No, I'll, I'll try to keep it relatively short. But I, it, I, the passage I picked to preach this morning is, a, is actually a passage of scripture that I, I like to use when I go to a church for the first time. And I may have even used it here before, a long time ago, but it's been a long time if I did. When Seth asked me if I would preach on the topic of evangelism, my mind automatically goes to this because this is, this is part of, of, of my life. It's part of what I teach, uh, both with students and at the seminary. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm just really passionate about this. And so if you don't have this verse memorized, you can open your Bible and turn to it. It's Acts 1.8 is the verse that we will specifically look at. Um, but while you're doing that, if you're doing that and thinking about it, I'm going to give you a, a couple of scenarios to think about a little bit. If you walk out of church today and you go out here and all of a sudden you hear the squealing of brakes and metal on metal, and you look up and you see the, this car crash take place, what are you going to do about that? Well, pray. Okay. Very first thing you should do is pray. Thank you. Uh, but the second thing is, you know, when the, the police come, they're going to want witness statements, right? They're going to ask people to, to what, what did you see? Now, would you do that? Yeah, pretty, pretty simple to do. I mean, do you have to be an expert in cars? Do you have to know all about the, the legality of who was supposed to turn right and who was supposed to turn left and who was supposed to stop? No, if you're a witness to a car crash, you just tell what you, you saw, right? Pretty simple. Okay, let's, let's ratchet it up a step. Let's say you walk outside and you're getting in your car and you, see a, you hear a gunshot and you see some guy fall down in the street, start bleeding, and somebody running off and they've got a gun in their hand. So what, then what do you do? Well, first you pray. <laughs> Second, you see if you can administer first aid. Uh, third, you tell the police what you saw. Now, you don't have to be a forensic expert, do you? You merely tell the police what you saw. Now, last step of this inter opening introduction, because I want you to really think about this, because this is, this is important. Let's say when you see 
when you hear the gunshot and you see the person fall down, you realize that the person that's done it is a member of the mafia. And this is part of an organized hit. And they are the most feared organized crime in, in the entire country. What do you do then? Police come and say, what'd you see? Do you report it? Because now it's a situation where it's not just a matter of reporting that you saw a shooting, but now there is a cost involved. Uh, and you're thinking, oh, do I want to live the rest of my life in witness protection? Uh, you know, am I willing to die for seeking justice in this situation? What, what do I do? I mean, that's not, not one most people think a lot about, but Gwen and I love crime procedurals and we watch them a lot. And we saw, saw one the other night that was kind of, uh, had kind of that feel to it. Uh, and unfortunately the witness at the end got, got killed. Uh, Jesus says in this passage, this is, in, in Acts 1.8, these are the last words that we have of Jesus before he ascends into heaven. The disciples have just asked, Lord, is it at this time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? You know, they're pumped. You know, they're going to come and kick the Romans out. The disciples still haven't caught on to exactly what the kingdom is. And Jesus, kind of, I can almost picture Jesus going, guys, 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 you know, you're going to learn. He says, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has set by his own authority, but you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and Judea and all Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the earth. Okay? You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. Now, I'm sure that everybody in here has undoubtedly read this passage before, and you may have given it some thought before, but I want to I look and dig into this and see exactly what it is that Jesus is saying to us. Because if you're talking about evangelism, this is, is the key to understanding everything about it. Uh, Seth may want to argue with me about that after, you know, he, 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 I don't know whether you're taping this or not, if he listens to it. But, but they're online. Okay. Hey, Seth, wherever you are. Uh, Jesus is calling us to be his witnesses. God is calling us to be his witness. In, in a sense, when, when, when we are given this commission, and this is Luke's version, in a sense, of the Great Commission, he's saying God is on trial. Jesus is going to be on trial. And whether or not the world gets the proper view of who God is and what Jesus has done is up to you. You have a choice. Okay? And so this morning, as we, as we look at this passage, I want you to think about what it is that I need to do in order to be faithful, to be a witness for God, for Jesus himself, okay? So we already kind of, in a sense, discussed what a witness is, right? He says, you shall be my witnesses. A witness in, in the Greek, in English, whatever, is a legal term generally. And so the illustrations at the beginning of seeing a car accident, seeing a murder, seeing a mafia hit, they, they all tie into this. Uh, a witness is merely someone who reports what they've seen. Um, when, when Christians think about evangelism, generally they're thinking about, you know, someone who has to be an expert in apologetics. Uh, they have to understand theology. They have to be able to, to explain the fine nuances of the faith to people who will undoubtedly be hostile and not be interested all of which may be true, although I find that a lot of times people are a lot more interested than we think they are, and that if we're open, it creates opportunities to talk about Jesus. But, but anyway, the, the, the fact is that, that these, these opportunities that are going to arise come because we have been, we've been tasked merely with telling the story, okay? So an evangelist is a person who, you know, Usually old people think of Billy Graham. I can't think of any evan modern evangelists today that, that get a lot of visibility. But, but we, we think of people becoming Christians. Usually we got to get somebody that's an expert to bring them, right? I mean, I'm, I'm not going to go out and witness somebody. Maybe I'll bring them to church. Uh, and that's not a bad thing. Bring them to church uh, because they're, we'll talk about it more in a moment, but there is a corporate dimension to witness as well that can be done in the context of the body of Christ much more effectively. But the fact is, God isn't calling 
necessarily people to be evangelists. He's calling them to be witnesses, and there's a difference. Evangelism is a spiritual gift. In Ephesians 4, it talks about the fact there's a gift of evangelism, and, and church growth specialists generally say that maybe 10% of the average congregation may have a gift of evangelism, which means they're going to be really good at leading people to faith. But the reality is the fact that they're only going to be good at leading people to faith when the seeds have been planted and the ground has been plowed. Ground has been plowed. See, I'm not a very good farmer here. The ground has been plowed. The seeds have been planted. It's been watered a lot because until, until the plant grows up, there can't be a harvest. And so it's important that we recognize that, that we are all contributing as witnesses to the ultimate success of what people will do as evangelists. And so that's important for us to remember, you don't have to be an expert. Jesus said, you shall be my witnesses, okay? Now, usually when we think about witnesses too, we think about talking, right? And when I, when I teach evangelism, when I teach witnessing to my students, and when I, I teach, you know, at the seminary level, uh, I usually say, when you think about being a witness, you need to think in terms of how God created you. He gave you one mouth and two ears, and you should use them in that proportion because you're not going to be effective at being a witness if you're talking about something that people are not remotely interested in or able to hear even if they were interested in it. Um, there's a, if you go online and, and to, to the fellowship of Ilba.com, I did a series of, of con conversations on, on the Engels scale with uh, one of my colleagues. And I don't know whether you've ever seen it or not. The Engels scale is actually... Uh, it starts up here at uh, zero, or my, no, minus 10 here, works its way down to zero, and it goes to plus 10. And basically, Professor Engels, who was at Fuller Seminary, said that, that our responsibility as believers is to learn to listen to where people are at. And if a person's at minus 10, I, in other words, they're an atheist, they know nothing about God, they're not interested in God, you're probably not going to take a person who's an atheist and take them all the way down to zero, which would be conversion, and then on down to becoming a, a super saint, right? So he says, our responsibility is to listen and then to try to move a person one notch down at a time. So if I'm listening to someone who doesn't know Jesus and I find out that they, they actually have already heard the gospel before, I can start at a different place with what I have seen and done and heard than I would if I was working with a, you know, some of the Chinese students that I've worked with that come as complete atheists. So it's important that two ears, you listen, before you talk. Talking is important. But what do you talk about? Again, let's, let's go back to that initial illustration. When you see an accident, you don't have to be an expert. What do you do? You say what you've seen. And so to be a witness for Jesus Christ requires you to have a relationship with Jesus. You don't have to tell them all the answers to their questions. You need to, to talk with them about what you've seen God do. Has God done anything in your life? If he has, you should talk about that. And that you don't even need the angle scale for, because you could talk. I mean, we, this morning at the, the, we go to Stratford Park uh, Bible Chapel over in West Champaign, and we have a communion service every Sunday morning before the regular worship service. And it's an opportunity for people to request songs and stuff. And uh, we sang, Gwen, what was the first song we sang? Tell the old, old story. Yeah. Uh, I love to tell the story. That's what it is. I love to tell the story. Do you love to tell the story? Not, not necessarily the four spiritual laws, but do you love to tell what Jesus has done in your life? I, I'm sorry, but I've been in a lot of churches, folks, where people sing that song and they don't love to tell the story. They're scared to death to tell the story. They're ashamed to tell the story. They're afraid of the fallout. Do you think that they were going to be talking to the mafia hitmen? But if, if we love Jesus, if we've really had our lives touched and changed by him, you don't have to be flamboyant. You don't have to be great at it. You don't have, you just have to say what God's done. Now, that starts with how you came to faith. I'm sure all of you can probably find a time where you, you first initially really began to believe. Hopefully, some of you have, you know, you began to believe as a child and you can't really find a point in time when you didn't believe. <laughs> May your tribe increase. I would love to see families with kids that never had to go through the depths of sin that, 
that an idiot like I had to when he was in college before he realized the need for Jesus. But, but some of you may have those, those dramatic conversion stories. Well, you can tell those stories. Those are good stories. They're important stories. And God wants you, he doesn't want you, he commands you in this passage, you shall be my witnesses, right? But if that's the only story you've got to tell is how you became a follower of Jesus, what's happened in the interim period? So we need to be living our lives with Christ in such a way that, that every day we have something that, that God speaks to us that we can speak to others if it comes up. You know, if you read something in the Bible, don't hesitate to share it with someone else. Uh, you know, if you've seen God do something, or, or maybe not seen God do, do something that you wish, don't be afraid to talk about that, because that's part of being a witness. That's part of plowing the ground. That's part of planting the seeds. And it's amazing. It can be, it, actually, it doesn't even have to be words, does it? It could be something that you do. If, some, if people know you're a Christian and you do something, they go, oh, that person's a Christian. They did something good. I mean, what's, what's the world hear most about Christians? You know, you read the newspaper. You know, Christians are they're nasty people. You know, they're on the wrong side of the aisle politically, or they, you know, have been involved in some kind of sexual sin. I mean, those are the stories that make the paper, right? Um, back in the 1980s, Steve Taylor sang a song called Meet the Press. I don't know if you ever heard that, ever heard of Steve Taylor. I'm dating myself here, but uh, it's, it's a song about the fact that, that the, the press doesn't treat Christians well. So it's been going on for a long time, but he, he said in that song, a Christian can't get equal time unless he's a loony cr committing a crime. Uh, and, and it's true a lot of times. And we become the counteraction to that. We, as we live our lives of love, before a world that needs it so badly, and people know that we're Christ followers, they begin to make that association. That's part of being a witness. It all goes together. Now, you, you can't just do the acts without having words, because then it's not clear, right? I mean, you could be a nice Jew, you could be a good atheist, you could be a Buddhist who has a heart, but if, if you're doing good things, and you're putting them together with the fact that you love Jesus, that's what he's calling you to do. Now, it's interesting I said that. That's what he's calling you to do, but he's actually not calling you to do something. You go, wait a minute. You just said it's a command. You have to do a command, right? But what really is distinctive about this passage, and, and I like this, and it, for a long time it didn't hit me, but, but if you look at it in the original language, what you find is normally if he was calling you to do something, he would say, you shall witness but he sticks a little helping verb in there that you don't usually see. And he says, you shall be my witnesses. Okay. What's the difference? But when I was in seminary, I, I was part of a large Baptist church. And on Tuesday nights, we used to, uh, we, we did evangelism explosion, which was a way to learn to share your faith. And then we would go out and we would visit people who had come to the church as visitors. And uh, it was an opportunity to train people that were going through the evangelism program and how to share their faith. And it was a great program. It still is a good program. Um, but every Tuesday night, you know, you learned the program, you learned the words, you learned the questions, you learned the illustrations, you went out and used them. And we saw people become Christians as a result of that. But that was doing witnessing. That was doing evangelism. And that was something that you could turn on at seven o'clock when you got to the church to go out and you could turn it off at nine o'clock when you got back. That's doing, witnessing. Jesus says, you shall be my witness. It's something that's to permeate everything that we are. I mean, it's an identity he's calling you to. You know, our identity as human beings who are citizens of the kingdom of God is to be witnesses. It's supposed to be as much a part of what we are as, I can't even think of a good example, as I am supposed to be bald. <laughs> I didn't like that one. I, I, I had a bad thought the other day. I thought, you know, when I get to heaven, I'm going to have a full head of hair. And then I thought, oh, what if when I get to heaven, everybody's bald? <laughs> uh, will that make heaven a little less enjoyable? Uh, anyway, that's, that's neither here nor there. So anyway, so it's a matter of being. It's something that you are. It's something that should permeate every thought, every fiber. Not because you're looking at, at something you've got to do, 
but it's because of something that you are in relationship with Jesus. I don't know about you, but, you know, I used to be in love. As a matter of fact, I still am. You know, when I first met my beautiful wife, uh, I couldn't see her actually at first because it was the first day of spring semester in 1975 on the South Lounge, outside the South Lounge of the Illini Union. It was about 14 below zero, and she had on a snorkel parka that came out to here, and I could see about this much of her face, and she kind of looked like Nanook of the North, you know. And, but, but once I, I actually got to see what she looked like, we started bumping into each other at the Illini Union, and, and she would bring me cookies occasionally, and I fell in love. And, you know, I, I started telling people. I, I just wanted, wanted to know I, I got this really cool girlfriend. And, uh, you know, that, that, that love that, has, that is between us is deep and mature. We both have gotten a little different looking than we did before. I, I used to have a thick head of red hair. Uh, but the, the, the fact is, I told people about a relationship that I had, something that I believed was real, something that not only was real, but became more real, that has grown to the point where yeah, I love my wife much more today than I ever have before. We still get mad at each other. We, we love each other more. We can actually, we can say we, you know, have these disagreements periodically because we, we love each other. So, but, but anyway, the, the point is the same is true with Jesus. If you have this relationship with him, it should be such a part of who you are that it just naturally spills out of your life. And when I see Christians, and, and it, this is true even for me sometimes, when I see Christians that are afraid or unwilling to share that relationship, I go, what's wrong with us? Well, what's wrong with this is the fact that we try to do it on our own. And that's the second important point of this. How do you go about being a witness? Okay. Before Jesus gives the command to be a witness, he gives the resource by which you're going to accomplish it. He says, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. Okay, and that's a very important thing to keep in mind, the fact that, that he doesn't tell... God never calls us to do something that he's not equipped us for in advance. And he gives us his spirit. I mean, who's the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is God himself. The Holy Spirit, when you become a follower of Christ, takes up residence in your life. And if the Holy Spirit is there, there is absolutely nothing that you cannot do. Right? I mean, if God can do anything and God lives in you, then technically you can do anything. But the, the problem is that we don't really ask for the filling of the Holy Spirit. We don't connect with him in the way that we should. I, I heard a sermon years ago, and the pastor said, I won't even get out of bed in the morning until I've asked God for more of his Holy Spirit. He said, before I put my feet on the floor, my prayer is, God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. And I started doing that. And it makes a difference. Because it orients you to who you are and what your priorities are and how you're going to accomplish those priorities. No matter what comes before you that day, if the Holy Spirit is in your life and you are allowing him control of your life, then you will be available to God to use in any way he wants, whether it's to help someone, whether it's to speak his words to someone, no matter what it is, he will give you the power to do it. Now, Jesus said, if you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Now, the Spirit's in me already. Why do I have to ask? I don't know. <laughs> it's because he says we're supposed to do it, right? And if he says we're supposed to do it, it's a good thing to do. And so I ask. I want more. If, if someone came to you after church and said, I'm going to give you money, all that you have to do is ask me for it. What would you ask for? Just for a dollar? I mean, I'd start out with a million. Hey, give me a million dollars, right? I could use that. Well, I don't need it, but I can think of a lot of good things to do with it. But God offers us something much more than a million dollars. And we are content with a dollar bill when we could have the million. And that Holy Spirit that indwells us, empowers us, and enables us, gives us eyes to see, gives us ears to hear gives us the same kind of insight into what's happening in the world that God gave to Jesus when he walked among us. Jesus was God, 
But Jesus was also a man, and he lived his life among us as a man. And Jesus said in John 14, 14, 7, yeah. I'll think of the reference in a minute. But he says, the works that I do, you shall do also. And even greater works than these you will do because I go to the Father. And it's in the context of him giving the Holy Spirit. Now, I have not raised the dead yet. I haven't even really prayed to raise the dead yet. I probably should have just, but, but why not? Why not try? Why, if, if Jesus says we're going to do his works, why not, why not give that a try? If I die, sometime in the next year or two. I hope any of you who come to my funeral will put your hands on the casket and say, Lord, raise him from the dead. Now, I might not like it because I might like, you know, have, getting a taste of heaven. I might not want to come back. But, but the fact is, God's not calling us to that for the most part. He's calling us to be witnesses, and he's giving us his spirit to do it. We turn the spirit's power off in our lives when we sin. So it's important that we keep our accounts short, that we confess our sins because he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, John says. When we, we sin, we turn off that power of the spirit in our lives. When we confess, we turn the power back on. And that's what God is enabling us to do. Now he's doing this because he wants, not just because he wants us to accomplish something, he could save everybody without us, right? but he wants to use us. He wants us to grow closer to him in the process. He's preparing us. Paul Bilheimer wrote a book called Destined for the Throne. He is preparing us to rule with him forever. And he's doing that by teaching us now. He's doing it by giving us the privilege of being his witnesses. So let's see, I'm getting short on time, so I don't want to miss anything that's important here oh i know what's next anyway uh, oh one other thing before i go on it, it, it's interesting again going back to the witness section that the command to be witnesses is not to singular it's not uh, um, jerry you be my witness it's not jim you be my witness it's y'all be my witness and so there is a corporate dimension to it now you are part of the corporate so it, it can be you know, Jason, you be my witness, but it's more cornerstone. You be my witness. The church in Champaign-Urbana, be my witness. Because huh, Jesus says, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples. How? If you love one another. And it's kind of hard to love one another all by yourself, right? There's no such thing as individual Christianity. And I have people that tell me, oh, I'm a Christian, but I don't go to church. I don't need church. And I go, well, and I got my doubts on whether you're a Christian or not, because that's not what the scriptures say. They say we need each other, that we're part of a body. If I cut off my finger, it's still my finger, but it's no longer part of a body, and it's not going to be around very long, right? It's going to just wither up and blow away. We need each other. And the world needs us to need each other. And I find it interesting that, the, that, that Jesus says that people will see that we are his disciples when we love each other more than when we love them. Doesn't mean we shouldn't love him. We should. There's lots of commands to that. But he says people will truly know that we're his witnesses. That we, we will be his witnesses. We'll know, they'll know that we're his disciples if we love each other. What happens if we don't love each other? Yeah, there's a lot of that going around too, right? <laughs> so, last point, and I'll be done. Last point is, where are we to be witnesses? You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, even to the remotest parts of the earth. Okay? So, where are we not supposed to be witnesses? Nowhere. Where are we supposed to be witnesses? everywhere that doesn't let us off the hook so if we go on vacation we're still on we're, we're still witnesses we're still on duty right if we go to aunt mary's for lunch after church today we're still witnesses it doesn't make any difference where we are but it's interesting that jesus starts out with jerusalem right matter of fact if you go back a little bit further in the context jesus says you're staying in jerusalem until what the father has promised 
comes upon you. So they're supposed to stay in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit gets there, right? Because they don't have the power to do it otherwise. But he starts in Jerusalem, and the church grew in Jerusalem, and it became well known in Jerusalem. It's been said that that maybe up to a third of the population of Jerusalem were followers of Christ by the time the Romans destroyed it in 70. That's pretty good, right? Especially when you consider the persecutions and stuff that arose. The problem was they stayed there. So what God do? He had to push them out a little bit, right? Stephen gets murdered. Persecution arises against the church, and it says they scattered. And as they scattered, what did they do? They talked about Jesus, and the church began to grow in other places. And you know, I, if I had time, I'd, I'd do a, a, a lecture for you from one of my missions courses on how God's worked those, how he's needed to work those, those little push-out nudges, which turned out to be pretty harsh at times because the church got stuck in Jerusalem or wherever it happened to be. I'm not going to do that. If you want to know more about it, let me know. We'll maybe arrange for a, a lecture on the 400-year periods of, of church history. But, but the fact is that God wants to reach our community, and we are best known in our community. Hopefully, we're best known in our community. People see you, they should, should recognize you. You should smile and say, hey, how you doing? You should talk with people when you get the opportunity. That After 30, how long have we been back here, Gwen? 30. Four years, 34 years. After 34 years in Champaign Urbana, lots of people recognize me. They may not know who I am. They may recognize me because of my cowboy hat or because I wear a, a Scottish uh, tartan hat occasionally. But they, they recognize me. And, and, you know, I can talk to people. I, I've worked out at the gym for years. I know lots of people. I coached soccer and basketball. I went to my son's games. I, I got to know, I mean, I, I literally know hundreds of people in this community. All opportunities when God opens a door for me to share the gospel with them. And I pray for them, a lot of them. And occasionally the Lord lays someone on my heart and enables me to really pray and look for an opportunity then. And it's amazing what happens when God begins to, to put someone on your heart. And you pray for them and you begin to talk with them and go, they became a Christian. Whoa, this is so cool. Or even if they don't, Karen may come along then and share with them. Or Jim may have them. Get them on your couch. You don't use a couch, though, Jim, do you? <laughs> so, but, but the fact is, you start in Jerusalem, and then as people leave, and in a community like Champaign-Urbana, which is so transient, they're going to take it with them wherever they go. And that's why Gwen and I have been here so long. We love to work with internationals who are going to go back to their home countries. And they're going to take what we've had a chance to share with them and pass it on. And even if they haven't become Christians, they're going to be friendly to Christians. And who knows, maybe some of the Chinese students that we've worked with, you know, may wind up and, you know, they didn't become Christians, but they're a judge or something like that. And they haul the Christians in. And they're getting ready to really bring down this hammer on them. And they think, wow, but I remember Christians in the States were pretty nice. Maybe I should I'll be a little nicer to these people. You don't know how God's going to use that. But you shall be my witnesses. He's not asking for volunteers. He's commanding, you shall be my witnesses. He's not, not expecting us to you know, shrink back. He's expecting us to be bold in the power of his spirit. And we can do it. And it will enhance our own relationships with God. It will enhance our own relationships with one another. God will bring revival on the church if we ask for it. And then he will create an awakening in the community that will be powerful if we're prepared for it. Because when we're prepared, then he will bring it, and not before then. So, you know, you may be like the, the guy who goes out and sees the car accident. You just report that. There may be a greater cost to it. The word mar uh, for witness is actually martyr. And it got its connotation as one who died for a cause because Christians ended up having to die for their, their faith at times. And it, so your witness may wind up someday being like seeing the, the mafia hitman. But if you are faithful and you work for, for that which is true, Jesus is the truth, and you work for that which is just, Jesus wants us to be just. As you begin to do those things, God is going to take those and shape them and use them until he, people see Jesus once again in our communities. 
That's all I got. Thank you very much. Oh. Oh, okay. Yeah. I probably wasn't going to drink that. Uh, <laughs> well, thanks, Michael, uh, for sharing just uh, all of your wisdom uh, on that topic and your knowledge and experience and your passion for it. And I felt there were a lot of very practical things in there as well. I, I'm a lot less intimidated, honestly, <laughs> to be a witness, like you said, rather than you know, going out and doing something. That's often how we think about it. So that, that's definitely part of it. But but yeah, just thanks so much for sharing that. And I, I know that as witnesses, we, you know, as cornerstone, we can be a witness. And I think we are doing that a lot actually through various initiatives that I won't go into, but um just very timely message. So thank you so much. Uh, this is our time of communion. Uh, we will not be taking communion here in person. Uh, we'll just do a time of quiet reflection uh, and we will be singing a song. Um, again, just the worship team will be um, singing and, and we can all listen. Um, if you're on Zoom, you're definitely welcome to you know partake at home. Um, uh, just let me pray real quick. Lord, we know that uh, as we do share your word, that that uh, there are there can be cost to that, and and we know, Lord, when you came and shared God's good news, that the the cost was death, Lord. Um, we acknowledge your death. We acknowledge uh, just the price that you paid, Lord, um, and we just pray that. Uh, we can appreciate that every day, and we thank you so much for uh, dying to your body to give us uh, your Holy Spirit and to give that to us every day, Lord. Uh, what a gift that is. And let us just um, reflect on that and um, uh, come to your table uh, in the ways that we can in this time, Lord. Amen. Jesus. 
I wasn't sure if we had anybody lined up to do the prayer time.